This is going to be uh, a presentation about uh, characterizing and correcting um, rare mutations in CFTR. If uh, you're looking for another session, I think um, transplant is next door, and then clinical trials and access are both upstairs on the fourth floor, I think in the San Antonio rooms. So nobody's leaving, so apparently everybody's uh, in the right room. That's great. So we're going to uh, um, have presentations first from uh, Catherine Tuggle, who is our uh, uh, director of research, and then uh, uh, John, or uh, Jed Mahoney, is going to follow, and Jed is a scientist at the CFFT lab up in uh, Lexington, Massachusetts. Again, we'll be um, um, capturing questions uh, submitted at uh, cff.cnf.io. So any questions that you have uh, based upon the presentation, or perhaps you came with uh, questions that aren't, um, may not be addressed during the, the presentations, feel free to um, enter, enter them in, and um, I'll moderate um, a Q&A at the end of uh, Jed's presentation. So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Catherine Tuggle, who will um, talk, us, uh, talk to us about um, ongoing scientific efforts. Great. Thank you, Chris. And also thank all of you for uh, sticking it out till the end here. Uh, we appreciate having you in this uh, session. Hopefully this will be very informative for uh, most of you. So just to give you a quick outline, we've uh, got a little tag team going in here today, so we'll, we'll break it up a little bit. We'll start out with our therotyping effort, which uh, Dr. Scotch introduced yesterday during the opening session. Um, and this is kind of our, some of our short-term efforts to try and get modulators to all people that we think may benefit from them. This will be followed up by a little more of our grand vision of the one-time cure, and uh, Jed will be giving that talk. And then at the end, um, like I said, we'll go into kind of questions and answers and anything that you really want to know that we didn't cover. So just starting out very basic, as was mentioned yesterday, um, thanks to the work that's been done at Johns Hopkins University and the CFTR2 project, we're now, uh, we now know that there's over 1,700 mutations in the CF gene that cause cystic fibrosis. Currently, there are two drugs available that treat the basic defect. The first, Kaleidico, which is approved for patients with one or more copies of 10 mutations, including the G551D mutation, R117H. Together, this uh, group of patients includes about 8% of our population. In addition, we have the Orcombi, which is the combination between Ivacaftor and Lumacaftor. And this is approved for patients with a Delta F508 homozygous mutation, so a Delta F508 on each allele. But as you can see by the area covered in gray, so we have about almost 55% of people with CF are covered by these two drugs. However, we have a ways to go. We've got about 45% of mutations left to cover. I want to draw your attention to the um, about 4%, it's up in the top corner here, of mutations that we think may actually benefit from the currently available drugs that are on the market. They just aren't currently approved by FDA and therefore patients don't have access. So the talk that I'm going to be doing today is really focused on that 4% and possibly expanding out even further. Really what we're hoping is we could target up to 95% um, of patients with, uh, with uh, modulators. So how do we actually do this? There's a couple of different ways to group mutations. Um, and I think that's, that's an important way to look at it is um, if, if you're looking at every individual mutation by itself, again, we'd have to have 1,700 approvals. And I think that's just not realistic in this landscape. So ways that we can do it are we can look at mutation class, or we can look at this new concept called therotyping. And I'll go into both of those in a little more detail on the next pages. But really, why do we care about doing this? It's not just a scientific exercise. This could actually make a real difference. Um, part of it is it, these uh, categorizations may help in aiding um, the design of clinical trials so that you can identify the right patients that may benefit from these treatments and design the clinical trial to bring them in, group them together, and actually get the, the uh, drug approved for that. Additionally, kind of a longer-term vision and goal is to be able to use it to inform personalized medicine decisions. So as we have lots of modulators on our, you know, for us to choose from, we want to make sure we're choosing the right drug for the right patient so that they will have the maximal benefit. So when we talk about CFTR mutation classes, there's typically five classes that we think about. And I'll try to march through this a um, little, little quickly because this is not the main focus of the talk. But traditionally, we've looked at the five mutations where class one mutation over, so on the far left, you have a normal functioning CFTR protein. This is ideally what we want to see in everybody. Um, however, with uh, class one mutations, uh, no CFTR is made. A lot of your X mutations, so the G542X, would fall into this category. Um, and these patients currently do not receive any benefit from modulators. And these are the, um, the patients that would be uh, helped by the new nonsense screening efforts that uh, Dr. Scatch mentioned yesterday. 
Class II mutations, the CFTR protein is made, however, it's not processed appropriately, therefore you don't have it expressed on the surface of the cell, and therefore you have a non-functional protein. In this category, you have the Delta F508, but you also have a large number of other mutations, and two that I'm going to highlight because I'll show you some data on them in a few minutes are the N1303K and the A455E. Class III mutations are our gating mutations, and in these, the protein is made, it gets to the cell surface, however, the protein remains locked shut. And this, uh, the G551D and some of the other gating mutations that are currently able to be treated with Kaleidico fit into this category. Your class four are the conductance mutants. So you have a channel, but it doesn't open all the way. So you have a limited flow of chloride into the, the um, outside of the cell, and therefore that results in the, the phenotype of the disease. And then class five mutations, um, this is commonly, um, one of the examples would be the 3849 three, plus 10 KB C to T transition. Um, these are low amounts of CFTR that are expressed at the surface, and these will need to be um, uh, approached in a very different way, potentially. <laughs> so while the CFTR classes help us give, a, give us a little bit of an idea of where we can go and how we can group the mutations, we've learned through scientific studies that these are not a true representation of all the defects that may be seen. When you look at Delta F508, you actually have a combination of uh, defects that occur. So we've, uh, we needed to find a new way to approach this problem, so the term therotyping has come up. And therotyping is a functional grouping of mutations based on their response to a particular therapy. And we think this is extremely important because, as I mentioned, it's not an academic exercise of, well, how does this work in a lab, but how does this work in patients, and how can we treat it in a patient? So when you're looking at therotyping, an example of one of these groups may be partial function mutants, gating mutations, and those that may have a decreased um, expression may all respond to a particular potentiator. That would be a particular therotype. Those would be potentiator responsive. However, there are other mutation classes. They may respond to multiple therapies or need multiple therapies um, to, to be able to be corrected, and these would belong to a different therotype. So you start kind of breaking down in a little bit of a different way. An example of this would be a nonsense mutation where you would require a read-through agent to get the protein to be made, and then you may also require a potentiator or a corrector in order to get full function of the protein. We think for trial design that the therotypes may be more important than mutation classes and may help us, again, group smaller groups of patients into a larger study to be able to get the drugs approved. So to give you a, a more graphic representation of what we're talking about here, so on the far left corner, um, so with, when we're trying to look at uh, how we think we may uh, produce a clinical response in patients, there are two real parameters we're looking at. How much protein do you have and how well does it function? So if you see the G551D over there, there's a large number of the protein expressed. However, it's non-functional. So by the red dot is where it would be normally. However, the addition of a potentiator would shift it up to where you see the green dot right above it. And we think that that's, well, now we know through clinical results that that's actually in a clinically beneficial range. Um, so obviously, they have a drug that would work for it. Again, if you look over in the third panel on C, again, you have multiple mutations that have high quantity, low function, but with the potentiator, they all respond. But to move you back to panel B with the Delta F508, obviously we have a low number of channels and a low amount of function, as seen by the red. With the addition of a corrector, you can now shift the amount of protein up to that yellow dot there. And then with the addition of a potentiator, you may actually move it into the clinical uh, response range. Again, this has been proven in the clinic. So these show some evidence of um, kind of our thought process behind why we think this may be useful moving forward. Um, so it sounds all great in theory, but how are we actually going to do this? So there's two main ways that we can look at it. The first is laboratory-developed cell lines, and I'll go into those again in, um, or in the next slide. And then there's patient-derived cells, and these are receiving a lot of attention right now. Um, so the three main areas that we're investing in at this point are really um, looking to translate to help us um, decide how to move things forward to the clinic are human bronchial epithelial cells. So these are cells taken from the airways of people with CF. These can come in the form of transplanted lung tissues, which has been used um, historically for the development of drugs. Or it can also be done through um, bronchial brushing. So when uh, patients go in for a bronchoscopy, we may be able to collect cells from there that we could use in the laboratory. Human nasal epithelial cells. These are cells that are just collected by a brush or a scrape of the nose and grown in a dish afterwards. And then intestinal cells, where biopsies are taken from the either large or small intestines, and these can be grown um, in multiple different ways. For the data that I'll show um, in, the, in the next couple of slides, it will primarily focus on intestinal cells because those have been the most well characterized at this point, but almost anything we can do with the intestinal cells, we can do with these other cells as well. So laboratory-developed cell lines. 
So it's important to use these. They're great tools. We've used them in the lab for a number of years. Um, but they're very beneficial because not all CF-causing mutations have been characterized, so we need something to look at. Additionally, since uh, patients, collecting patient cells is sometimes not as easy to, to do, especially when you're looking at mutations that may occur in less than 10 individuals in the world, how do you really study a mutation and understand how it would respond? So these cell lines allow you to generate any mutation you want. They don't normally express CFTR. We can put CFTR in them with all the different mutations and really understand the defect. Um, so these, like I said, they've been a workhorse for a number of years. So this, uh, this figure here is very busy, and I don't expect you all to, <laughs> to look at this and understand everything on it. But this is some data that was generated by Vertex uh, about three or four years ago, where they generated a large number of cell lines and wanted to see what the effect was on different mutations when you added Ivacaftor, the component in Kaleidico. And so as you look across the bottom, it's all these different mutations. And if you... Um, do you have a laser? So the, the black lines are baseline, so kind of residual function. As you can see, as you start moving over here to the right, there's really no function in these cells for the different mutations. Um, delta F508 right here, so really no function. With the addition of Ivacaftor, you have the white bars that show the additional function. So again, Delta F508, very little increase, not a whole lot there. However, if you look at a mutation like R117H here highlighted in blue, you had a little bit of residual function, and then with Ivacaftor, you had a large increase. This was the type of data that Vertex used to decide to pursue the study with the R117H population, which subsequently has been approved by the FDA, and patients are now able to access that drug. Well, they've now done this with a lot of other mutations, and so the study that was mentioned yesterday by Dr. Boyle with the um, Vertex 661108 study, where they were looking at residual function mutations, all of these mutations highlighted in the orange color are all mutations that were included in that study. So when they have delta F508 on one allele and one of these mutations on the other allele, they believe that they would have additional benefits. So these are great lines to get us started, well, help us to understand some of the basic defects. However, it's a very simplified version. It doesn't tell us the whole story. We don't know how different mutations, when they're in combination, would affect each other, and also what the genetic environmental factors might do. Which brings us to why we need to use personalized uh, patient-derived cell models. So these, patient, these model systems are obviously more relevant because they come from the patient. Um, as I mentioned with the, the nasal cells, the bronchial cells, and also the intestinal organoids, they're easily obtained from patients, and also you have the opportunity to do repeat collection. Um, they also bring in some of the complexities of the variability that may be observed in patients, as we know not all patients respond the same to every modulator, so we may be able to start picking up some of those subtle differences in these, these tools, and that's one of the areas that we're working to really develop. So we're obviously working on methods to understand the advantages and limitations of all of these tools and really to understand how to predict patient responses. So we've got this great video over here, and this is an intestinal organoid from a um, intestinal cells that express a wild type CFTR. And as you can see, the inside is swelling right here. So when it starts back, it'll be a little small hole here, and it starts to expand. So as you have the functional CFTR, you're able to stimulate it. The chloride flows into the middle, the water follows, and you see this swelling. And this is uh, called the organoid swelling assay. So over here on the left side, we have um, still frame images of organoid swelling assays. So we've got wild type, wild type, so non-CF cells at the top, delta F homozygotes, delta F508, A455E, one of those mutations I mentioned earlier that's a folding mutation, and then a delta F508, R117H. So as you can see in control cells, these are ones that have not been treated, just stimulated. You've got a large, large opening in the middle here. This indicates a very functional CFTR. This is the response you want to see. And if you add delta F508, you have a large opening there as well, so not, not a huge difference. However, if you look at this delta F508 over here, they're little tiny organoids, not much swelling, no function. And over here in the um, treated cells, they start to get a little bit bigger. But where you really start seeing the pronounced difference is with the delta F508 A455E, again, with no treatment, very minimal effect, which is what we see normally. However, with the treatment of um, VX809 and 770, so the Orcombi combination, we see a large increase in the volume here. And that's, that's showing that these cells may be able to predict um, responses to um, the modulator activities, especially when we're looking at the combination. However, so just to show you, so these are the graphical representations of the data that's over on the left, plus additional mutations. This is all work that's been done by the uh, Beekman group out of the Netherlands. See the delta F508 here with 
very minimal response here in the black. This is with 770, very little response, but with VX um, 770, 809, you do see it, an increase. Um, A455E, again, with 770, you do get a bit of an increase. With 809, 770, you get a huge increase. So we think that these patients may actually benefit from the Orcombi combination. However, I do want to draw your attention to N1303K. This is another one of those class two mutants that I highlighted earlier, and this shows the, one of the reasons that we think grouping by mutation class may not be as useful. Is, so this is in the same type of a class as the other two mutations. However, you, with the addition of 770 to 809, you have barely any increase. So we don't expect these patients to benefit from this combination based off of the assays here. And so I think that shows some of the value and really why we're putting this effort into the therotyping initiative is to really characterize these responses. So where do we go next? Obviously, in the laboratory, we have a lot of work to do to make sure we are able to develop and optimize these protocols and use these model systems to the best of our ability. Um, but we're also going to need to coordinate with our clinical efforts because it's great to say that something swells in a dish if we don't know how it responds in a patient. So this data, again, is um, from the, the Beekman group out of the Netherlands that shows on the bottom we have an increase in FEV1. They've actually taken patients that are not approved for certain drugs, have run their tests in, in the, um, the assays, and then have put the patients on the drug to see what the responses are. And what they found is a correlation between increases in FEV1 and increases in the organoid swelling, showing that they may be predictive of the, the clinical responses. So we're working with ongoing studies, the goal and prospect study, which are observational studies looking at patients on drug, as well as a number of off-label studies to really see if we can develop these correlations. So a lot of work to do, but exciting times, and I hope that in the next you know, six months to a year, we're going to be able to have a lot more information about a lot of these mutations that will help move us forward. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Jed to go into the second part of the talk. All right, guys. Let me start off by saying how, how excited I am to be here. I'm kind of new into the CF field. I haven't really seen you guys or met you guys in the past, but the more I interact with you, the more powerful you guys are, and the more, more it drives me to go to work and get back into the lab. Uh, so I'm going to start with this. Does anybody here, before you got to the VLC, know that we had a lab here at the CFF Foundation? Do you guys know that this is staffed almost seven days a week, 365 days a year, and that we're here working to find new, uh, new drugs, new therapies, and uh, new, uh, new techniques to to identify new drugs, so that's pretty great. This is actually where I work. I spend all my days right around here. These are actually my bench and my bay is right around there. So, uh, so let's get going. Okay, so I, I'm the stem cell biology group leader uh, at the CFFT lab, and so I'm here to talk to you guys about stem cells. And what I'd like you to look at in this slide in particular is this, um, where's the laser button? Here we go. This right here. This is actually a human lung that has had a cast made of it. So they pour down a plastic resin down the airway. And then they digest away all of the tissue. And what I want you to notice is look at this. It is incredibly complex. And when you look at the different cell types that go from the proximal airways, which are these larger airways, all the way down to the distal airways, they change pretty drastically. And so when we think about that, that's just the airway epithelium. We can add in the venous supplies, we can add in the muscle, the muscle, we can add in the neurons, and then you go, oh my God, this is an incredible organ that has unbelievable complexity to it. And then you think about development. How did this arise? And so that's what this green area over here is. This is a mouse developmental time point right here. This is the day one of a mouse after it's born, and then this is going back across the different developmental stages. And what you can see is way back over there, two small buds, and those two small buds contain a few cells that have the ability to make this incredibly complex organ. So those are bona fide stem cells of the lung. So let's get into some background. I'm going to give this talk a little bit backwards than I normally do. I'm going to give you some techniques, and then I'm going to tell you what we're going to do with those techniques. So what is a stem cell? Well, classic stem cell biology has two rules to it. Number one, the cell has to be able to self-renew. It has to be able to give rise to itself again. And number two, it has to be able to produce progeny that are different from the self. So this is the most standard, classical depiction of stem cell biology. We have this cell that can create itself many times over again. It turns into different cells. Those become functionally distinct, and then they become part of a tissue type that can become you know, something greater than the single one cell. But how do we use them to make drugs? We'll get to that. I think of it a little bit different from that classical just ladder picture. I think of it along Waddington's landscape. That's what this is called right here. And what this shows you is that there's really in development a time point where the cell is kind of rolling down the hill. 
And depending on its environment, depending on its stimuli, it'll nudge that cell into the different valleys, and those different valleys will lead to different tissue types and different cell types. And all together, that leads to every cell that the whole entire body can be made of. So the higher up in the hill you are, the more likely you are, the more likely you are to an embryonic cell. The farther down, the more likely you are to an adult cell. And then there are different levels of stem cells that you guys need to know about. There are tissue-specific stem cells. So they'd be farther down the hill, and they'll probably be lineage-restricted. So they'll only become lung epithelium, so they can become ciliated or secretory. They can't go into different, uh, to different tissue types. They're restricted to the organ that they reside. So about uh, 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago now, a man named Yamanaka, who's out in Japan, had a major breakthrough for the stem cell biology field. And he realized you can reprogram adult, fully mature, differentiated cells back to that embryonic-like state. So in this depiction, it basically means we can take that blood cell and bring it all the way back to the top of that hill. And when it's at the top of that hill, we can culture it continuously, and we can allow it to differentiate by uh, applying those nudges and those factors in the dish. And the beauty of this system is that cell that came out of the patient houses the exact genome of that patient. So if we're to take a G542X's patient's blood, we can make an induced pluripotent cell that harbors that exact allele. So that gives us a lot of power to be able to go after biomass, because we need that biomass to be able to study drugs. I'm going to change gears just a little bit here, because I feel like this is a very important slide to put up. Uh, recent advances, about five to six years now ago, CRISPR and Cas was really introduced. This is a very easy technology where scientists realized they could take a, an enzyme that's in a bacteria and then aim it at a genome, at any sequence that we really want, and it will cause a double-strand DNA break. And what that allows us to do is use that basic understanding of biology that we have to influence the repair. So in my example that I have here, we have a W1282X allele at the top. We can actually aim it right at that W1282X allele, have it cause a double-stranded break, influence repair by putting in a small oligo or small uh, chain of DNA, and then the cell will repair that mutated gene, and it can go back to normal. And that works both ways. We can do a normal to a mutant, and we can do a mutant to a normal. And what that allows us, as, as, Kristen, uh, as Catherine alluded to, is that we can get rid of modifying genes between populations. We can get down to the resolution of studying that one base pair change. So no longer am I testing my cells against somebody else's cells. I'm testing my cells against my cells again. So that brings you to my lab. So this is what our, our lab's focus is. And this is something that I really, truly believe is going to happen and it's going to work. And that's cell-based therapies that are mutation agnostic. So what we want to do is we want to take a patient that's been recently diagnosed with CF. We want to withdraw some blood, reprogram it back to that top of that hill. We want to genetically correct the disease-causing mutation, then nudge it down the hill to the lung lineages, and then transplant it back into the lung. And now that is a lot of work away before it's going to happen. There is so much work, but it is feasible and it is possible, but we have a long way to go. So that gives you the question of, well, what can we learn out of this? Well, we can actually learn quite a bit, because now we're starting to acquire these patient-derived cells. We're starting to create these identical cells, but just that one base pair different. And then we're starting now to push them down the hill to those lung lineages, and then use those for drug screening. So rare mutants, the double X mutants, for instance, there's not that much in the world that we can use for testing. But this gives us the ability to produce an incredible amount of biomass and then use that in our screening efforts. So I'm going to give you a little example that came out of our lab and how we do this work. Uh, we use developmental milestones. Basic biology that's gone on for the last 50 or 60 years have classified what signaling pathways are active in development and at what time. And then we just use spatial ideas and we say, okay, well, the lung comes from there, so let's activate those pathways in vitro, or in the, in the dish, and let's see what happens. And it turns out if we follow development, we can actually get to the point where we have lung specification in the dish. So here we have an early time point, and we have one or two green cells. Those one or two green cells are very similar to those first cells that turn on that will become the lung down the line. 
then we can continue this culture. We get these little patches. Those are very similar to those buds that are right up here. And then we can enrich all the way to getting about 70% of the cells in that culture to being lung specific. So that's quite good. That's not perfect. It's not pure. And they actually, at this exact moment, they're more reminiscent of that day one uh, of, of life than they are of a fully matured animal or fully matured adult. But still, we have the ability to put these into uh, drug discovery efforts. And so this right here is the picture of that you know, well-differentiated region of those lung-like cells. And then this is our standard electrophysiology result right here where we have a Delta F508 patient. We've added VX809, which is a, you know, we all know VX809. And you can see using these cells, we have that assay window and it's identifiable. So it's kind of a proof of concept for that VX809 in an air-liquid interface and doing the electrophysiology. And then when we look at these stop mutants, those X mutants, usually right here, this is how much protein you have. Well, we've been designing assays that will allow us to get past that stop codon and have protein produce. Now, these are both very much in their preliminary stages and have a lot of vetting to do, but possible, yes. Feasible, yes. We're going to get there, and we'll be able to do large-scale drug screens in the recent future, in the recent future, in the near future, <laughs> <laughs> in the near future, and, uh, and that'll help us to be able to discover new, new drugs and therapies for the people that are uh, suffering with the disease. Now, the most important slide, of course, is this one here. Um, this is going to have a little picture of the team that is working on this at the CFFT lab. And then basic uh, conclusions for you. We're looking for that one-time mutation agnostic cure, and we think we can do it with cell-based therapies and gene editing. And what we learn on the way is going to directly impact how we look for new drugs. So uh, we have a long way to go, everybody. So but we're doing this work, and you can believe me, there are people there today who are working and taking care of these cells right now because we know how important this work is. So I will put this slide up, which shows the entire lab here that's working up in uh, Lexington, and uh, be very excited to take your questions. So, Catherine and Jed, thank you very much. We have, um, so far, just two questions that have been submitted. Hopefully, um, we'll have some more submitted. Um, why don't I start off? I probably should have brought my glasses. Um, so, uh, first, uh, Catherine, perhaps this one is uh, best for you. Uh, the question is, yesterday, um, during uh, Bill's presentation, we talked about the groups of CF defects. You addressed this as well. Nonsense uh, type uh, stop mutations, missense. Could you briefly explain what the categories are? So I think you touched upon it a little bit, but um, uh, maybe we can, I don't know, let's see, can we reverse the slides a little bit? Yeah, so, are we on? Okay, um, sorry, lots, lots of slides back, keep going, keep going. There you go. Oh, there we go. So, so there's a couple of different ways to look at these. Um, so we've got the class one through five is a way to categorize, and that's based off of how far the protein gets in the, um, the process. So as I mentioned, in a, a, a class one, you just have no protein that's made. And this would be your, your classic X mutations or stop mutations, nonsense mutations, however you want to look at it. Um, the, a lot of the mutations that would fit in kind of the categories two through four, we would categorize as a missense mutation. Um, then splice mutations kind of fit in your category five, probably some down in category one. They kind of sprinkle a little bit. So as you can see, it starts to get very confusing. Um, so we're, we're trying to find new ways to categorize these mutations to, to really group a little bit better. So I, I'm not sure how well I'm answering the question. Um, really, if you're looking at kind of the, the different categories, though, I, I would say one of the big ways we look at it is we have the nonsense mutations. Uh, we have kind of the Processing mutations are going to be kind of a big group. Like I said, most of those are uh, missense. You have the gating and kind of conductance mutants, which they at least get to the surface. Um, and then we have the splice mutations. And we think that those are the different categories that are really going to need different types of therapies. So thank you. I think um, perhaps a, as a follow-up question, this one just came in. Um, will therotyping display the CFTR mutations by class? I think therotyping should be replacing the mutation classes. And it would, instead of thinking of them by classes, you may have 
in general, a class kind of fits into a therotype, but say class two mutants, there's so many of them that uh, you could end up with multiple different therotypes that would cover class two mutants. So I think it's, they're going to be two separate groupings. So you may be able to interchange them in some cases, but in other cases not. So we're, we're kind of shifting, I think, a little more towards the therotyping concept. I think for patients, it'll probably be more beneficial. Okay, fantastic. So let's see. Um, Jed, this one's for you. And um, it's probably uh, projecting into the future even uh, perhaps uh, further than your slides did. But um, uh, how would you return modified autologous stem cells back into the airway? Uh, wow, okay. Good question. That's the question? Okay. That's uh, the question. So, <laughs> that, that's actually, there's ongoing research that's um, uh, just starting to break into this field right now. So Andy Vaughn, who's out at UCSF, as well as some other uh, researchers, are actually starting these, uh, this work within the animal models. Um, what we've, what we've learned is that uh, the lung is usually very good at expelling whatever gets put into it. It's, basic, it's one of its basic functions. So if you try and put any cell into the lung, it usually gets coughed out or it gets gobbled up by the immune system. It knows that it's not supposed to be there and it will kill itself. Um, so one of the ways to get around that has actually been through lung injury. Now, I'm not suggesting that we you know, undergo massive lung injury to a CF patient right now, but again, it's more of a proof of concept for everybody at this point in time where Andy was able to use uh, H1N1, which is a very potent lung-destroying virus. Uh, he would instill that virus into the animal, wait a few days. That would cause the ability of the lung to extrude everything to go away and that would give the time for the instilled cells to sit down, they'd find the basal lamina, or they'd find where they're supposed to be, and then they would engraft and expand. And that's really the first really, truly believable article that came out and talked about the installation. So the work is ongoing. Uh, we'd have to find a little bit less of an invasive way to do it in a patient. I understand this. But as long as we can get feasibility, then we know we can find the right way to go down the line. So feasibility first, and then we'll, we'll, get, we'll get going from there. Okay. So another one um, here for you, Jed. Are there cell types other than airway cells that are good candidates for uh, modified stem cell retransplantation? Um, uh, I would love to come up with one for you off the top of my head, but I'm going to say... Uh, I'm, I'm going to aim at those airway cells for the, the transplantation. I don't think we can do a smooth muscle cell for transplantation. I don't think we can do any blood-borne cells. I know there has been some work with mesenchymal cells that are out there, and whether that would help in CF, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I would really aim for that basal cell in particular. So a lot of the work that we do is to get to that basal cell fate. So we want to get as close to the basal cell. And the basal cell, for those of you who don't know, is the you know, well-classified progenitor cell of the lung. It, it, it's known to expand under injury and then be able to differentiate both, both the ciliated and secretory cells of the lung. So if we can get to that fate, I think that's the one we'll have the most success in doing airway cell-based therapies. Okay. So um, let's see here. Um, Catherine, this one would be for you. Uh, what needs to be done to determine a mutation's therotype? Will this be a significant challenge when typing 1,700 different mutations? Yes. No. Um, so, so obviously, to, to really understand the therotyping, you would need to evaluate, mutate, evaluate the different drugs currently. Like I said, there's two approved. Um, but as we ad have additional, mutation, or additional drugs that are approved, obviously that, that pool in, in, increase. Um, so you would need to be able to test the drugs on the cells. We have an uh, effort ongoing right now um, working with some of those laboratory-based cell lines that I mentioned where we're going to be looking at hundreds of mutations to try to understand do they respond to the, to the drugs or do they not. And I think this kind of gives us a first pass. So rather than trying to go and collect a, a cell from every single patient or at least a patient for every single one of those 1,700 mutations, it gives us a, a quick way to understand, okay, these mutations look like they'll respond and these mutations look like they won't. And then we can start kind of putting them into these buckets, which then we can go and collect cells from patients to then see if what we saw in those, in those engineered or those laboratory cell lines also occur in the, the human uh, cells. So... Okay. So, uh, Catherine, another one for, for you? So, well, I'll ask this one and then jump back. Okay. So, um, let's see. So, can you explain a frame shift mutation? I would rather okay. do that one. So, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that. All right. So, um, a frame shift mutation is uh, often occurs so... 
the A's, C's, G's, and T's that make up, uh, these are the four nucleotides that make up your DNA. So as um, they're divided up into individual codons, so A, C, G, that uh, tells the cell to make a, to, when it's making a protein, to put a certain type of uh, amino acid in that peptide chain. CFTR is made up of 1,480 amino acids. So a frame shift mutation uh, causes a, it's either, it's caused by either an insertion into the DNA of a new nucleotide or perhaps a uh, deletion of a single or multiple uh, nucleotide. So it either inserts an A, C, G, or T or it deletes one of those. And therefore when the, um, what the process is called transcription, that's where you take information from DNA and then you make it into RNA, and then from RNA you go to a protein through a process called translation. The frame shift mutation gets you, shifts you out of that, uh, there's three nucleotides, and either causes it to read, jump forward or jump backward, and you end up with a uh, amino acid um, sequence that's not correct. So that's probably the easiest way to describe a frame shift mutation. There's many uh, reasons for uh, that type of mutation to occur. Um, we could uh, go into all the different types of uh, mutations, but that's probably beyond the time that we have today. So one more question. Okay. So let's see here. Um, Jed, this last one's for you. Okay. After introducing uh, reprogrammed cells, how long will it take to correct all the mutated cells? Um, after reintroducing mutated, how long would it take? You know, that's a, that's, if I understand the question properly, which I believe is to say that after cell-based therapies, how many of those cells would you need to actually have be the corrected cell to cause an amelioration of the phenotype or to lose the disease? Um, and I don't, I don't know. When I look at the 809, for instance, you see 5% of, of CFTR becoming functional at the apical membrane. So if we could get 5% of those cells, would that be enough? I don't, I don't know. Uh, that's going to be work that we'll have to do. Um, but in reality, I don't think we have to get every, every, every cell. I think if we can target the smaller airways in particular, where the disease root burden is really, really high, where you get those mucus plug formation, if we could target those airways in particular and get a higher amount of engraftment there, I think that would help. Um, and how long those cells will stick around, I don't, I don't know. These, these are studies that need to be done and are, are ongoing in the uh, small animals right now. So uh, it's kind of a tough question to ask uh, because we're still at the infancy of understanding cell-based therapies. I hope that was the question that was asked. So <laughs> if not, there's a different answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So how are we doing on time? Are we? We're done. Okay. Thank you.